All right, so we're going to get started. This is our Lighthouse session, and we have a, a couple things we want to share with you guys tonight. And I'm um, going to introduce who is going to be speaking this evening. Uh, Mr. Ryan Gable, Mr. Noah Vauder, Ms. Kristen Kopis, Ms. Becca Carruthers, Mr. Casey Shoemaker, and then myself, Josh Hendrickson. And you can kind of see up there what our different roles are. Um, this evening, our agenda is to let our middle school English language arts team tell you about all the great things they're doing um, that I think is, is really unique to, I wouldn't say the state of Iowa just because I don't know, but unique to um, experiences I've had in other schools. And our middle school math is here as well to talk about some of the ways they've changed the practice in their classroom this year. And then we're going to talk about our middle school attributes for success, which is, is really in its infancy right now. We just started it. You guys should have a handout uh, uh, with a sample of a student's um, attributes for success, but I'll talk about that here after these guys go ahead. So without further ado, our middle school English language arts team. Kristen Kopis. I teach sixth grade reading and English language arts. This is my 16th year as an educator with my 15th school year at Almernet. Um, I'm going to share with you today the focus that we've been working on in sixth grade, which is developing research skills for the students to use in seventh grade and then in life beyond high school. A point of emphasis that we've worked on with the students is that they're always Researching from, you know, even when you're an adult, you research how to buy bed sheets or where you're going to go on vacation or you fall down a rabbit hole on WebMD trying to figure out your symptoms. <laughs> but what we're looking at is making sure the students know how to synthesize information and use reliable sources, which is a crucial skill to develop as they go, out, go throughout their lives. So how I've been working on this with my teaching partner, Mr. Plotz, is collaboration through English and social studies, and making sure the students are having multiple exposures to the skills that we're asking them to investigate and try and learn. By working together, we develop a common language for our students. We're saying, this, they're saying, hearing the same thing from two different teachers, and between the two of us, we have each kid for four class periods, half of their school day. Also through collaboration, we're able to introduce and then fine tune the skills that we've been working on. What we've done so far with our sixth graders is um, the first project of the collaborative, um, the first collaborative project we worked on this year was 3D maps. And this is a social set, it was a social study standard of how to read a map and also why civilizations were chosen, chose where they lived um, throughout the geography of the land. Once these maps were built, Students were then using descriptive language to write how we would travel across the land that they created. Um, students had to use a map scale as part of their directional and part of their directions writing, um, which, which linked our English and social studies standards together. Another project that we did collaboratively was our civilizations research project. In this project, student learned about the eight qualifiers of what makes a civilization. Then each of my three English classes had a different civilization to learn about. There was Babylon, Sumer, and Persia. In this project, students learned how to evaluate sources, making a basic MLA citation, and researching. From there, students chose five of those eight qualifiers of a civilization to provide evidence that their culture was indeed a civilization and they wrote a seven paragraph essay in sixth grade, which they were pretty shocked by. I was not because I knew that they could do it, but that amount of writing was very new to them. And then our most recent collaborative project was our Egyptian magazine. This was a jigsaw group project. So a jigsaw project means each student does their own part and it comes together to make a whole. They worked to create a realistic magazine with a cover, a section about the authors, articles, advertisements, and a back cover. Students were to provide two articles and one advertisement on topics of their choice. This tied back 
to the collaboration that we had done before with the qualifiers of a civilization, the magazine needed to have, each qualifier needed to be present in the magazine. So for example, a qualifier is, is a com having a complex religion. So students might choose an Egyptian god to write about or the belief in an afterlife. And through the project, the students used and built on their previous skills, like finding sources, resource researching, and synthesizing information, then using their findings to write as a reporter, or write as an archaeologist, or a doctor. The students also created advertisements and used two persuasive strategies to advertise ancient Egyptian topics like mummification, cats, or join, joining the pyramid building team. Um, I have here an example of what the students' articles look like. This is a front cover that they created for one of the groups. So they have their title, Pyramid of the People, or People of the Pyramid, sorry, and different articles that they could find inside. Um, in the future, we're going to continue to apply skills in multiple settings and create cohesion across the sixth grade curriculum through the work that we're doing in English language arts and also in social studies. And the last thing I'll share with you is a student example that I have. This is the same student on the three different projects that I highlighted. So the first is this student's map writing. And some of the things that you can see here include, he, they had to write about longitude and latitude, the distance and time to travel going from Alvernet to their map place that they created. A lot of the students chose the place of like Hawaii, where their map was, and then they had to figure out how to get there, where is that in the world. Um, we used, also worked on scale measuring from place to place, directional writing, and then occupations a person would have based on geography there. The second, oh, I skipped one. <coughs> okay, one of them is not here. Anyways, okay, so Egyptian Magazine Project was the last one. So this is how that student developed um, their writing since then. This is the same student I showed you previously. Um, this writing now has a hook. They're writing to inform, they're using details from their research, and it's, um, it also includes a concluding sentence. All right, I'm gonna hand it off to Mrs. Brothers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I would and to highlight the work that we're doing as a middle school. We have a great staff. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Becca Crothers. Um, I'm in my third year teaching and my first year at Alburnett. Um, so in seventh grade, um, providing relevant experiences import is important for seventh graders who often ask the question, why do we have to do this? When am I going to have to do this in real life? Um, we often talk about formal writing as they advance through school and should they choose college and beyond. Um, one way that the middle school teachers have tried making re uh, writing relevant and also aid in writing ability is the use of the race strategy. Um, race, as you can see on the graphic there, stands for restate, answer, cite your evidence, and explain what that means. So coming in, um, we want to really work on organizing students' writing. So this is the format in which the vast majority of our writing is done in seventh grade. Right off the start of the year, we started these um, routines and put these in place. I've seen firsthand how the consistent use of this routine has helped students grow in their writing from organizing their thoughts to citing relevant evidence from the text to support their ideas. Students in November were assigned their first essay. Students compared concepts from an article that we read in class and how those ideas from the article were consistent with another short story that we read in the unit. In that essay, 48% of students were proficient in their writing. We finished up, we just finished up another essay in February, a couple weeks ago, where students were doing the very same thing, um, comparing art or ideas from an article and then comparing those with a short story that we read as well. Um, 50, in this time, 56% of students were now proficient in their writing. So we're seeing that growth from using this consistently. Um, I contribute this growth to the regular writing routines we have in place in seventh grade reading in ELA. In addition to looking at data and using the race strategy regularly, I also work closely with one of our amazing special ed teachers, Chloe Fluha. She and I currently co-teach two different sections together. We have just begun a co-teaching style of parallel teaching. In parallel teaching, we split our classes into two groups. She has a smaller classroom, so she usually takes six students, and I keep about ten. Um, we teach simultaneously, her in her room and me in mine. 
Um, we're hoping the use of these smaller groups and class sizes will help us have more intentional, um, be, be more intentional, well, intentional with our interactions with our students and better support those students who need more one-on-one -on -one time in the general ed classroom setting. Uh, the groups we have are not ability-based, so it is not spotlighting students and shining a light on those who need more support. Uh, we're strategic about who we select for each group. We include a variety of students in the two groups, ranging from high-performing or high to those who may need more support. So not, you know, pointing students out. That's all I have. <laughs> All right, for eighth grade, I wanted to focus today on um, pretty much the biggest thing I challenge our students with, and that is growing as a communicator throughout the year. So that kind of looks like uh, speaking, listening, and writing. And we're currently doing my favorite unit of the year, and that is mock trial. Um, so if you've had a kid in my class, hopefully I've talked about this at some point, but it seems that most of them enjoy it. Um, so what I do is I split students into lawyers, witnesses, and jury members. And they focus on the state standards of citing text evidence, the dreaded public speaking one of presenting findings, and then argumentative speaking. So the reasons I really like this unit and project overall are because it, I feel that it makes students really get excited and buy into what we're working on. Um, and it shows them a real life application of the things we do in the classroom. So I've noticed we're doing it right now. Um, if you know eighth graders, not all of them get super excited about school. Um, but in the last week, I've had kids dress up as lawyers, doctors, a police officer, and I've never asked them to dress up. So that shows me they really care. Um, they buy into it. I've also seen kids who would shake at the thought of giving a speech, stand in front of 25 classmates, and answer questions braver than I could. So it's really, really cool to see. Um, just seeing those connections made at the standards, I think, in ways they won't forget. So just wanted to highlight that. And then other things I think have gone really well this year, I've had a chance to work with Katie Wyman, a special ed teacher at our school, um, and work one-on-one -on -one with a few different students. And I've learned a lot of strategies I feel like I can employ in the general education classroom I may not have gotten to know otherwise, so that's been really cool. Um, and then also Becca being new this year has been great to work with. We've had a little bit of turnover with our seventh grade team in the past couple years for ELA. And I'm really, really excited to see what next year looks like, knowing that I've worked with Becca multiple times a week, knowing what their kids are doing, knowing what they'll come into as eighth graders. And I really think it's gonna set them up with success for high school. So I feel very lucky to work with both of these two. I think we have a really strong team and am very excited to see what the next few years look like. Thank you. Incidentally, my son is the defendant in that trial, and as at home, he looks pretty guilty. When I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That. <laughs> yeah. All right, my name is Ryan Gable. This is my eighth year teaching, fifth year here at Albernet, and I teach sixth and seventh grade math. I'm Noah Botter. This is my third year here teaching, and I teach eighth and ninth grade math. Um, so we're going to kind of split this up because we have very similar kind of classrooms. Uh, so we have kind of three big talking points we're going to talk about. Um, the first one, I know it's second on the list, but we're going to talk about co-teaching. Um, about my second year here, in like the first couple days, we're going to say, hey, Mr. Gable, you're going to co-teach with us. Um, but now this is the fourth year doing it. Uh, I've had the experience of working along with Chloe Fluhop that Mrs. Crothers talked about along with uh, Nicole Stevens, who is also another special ed teacher that also has a math background or math degree. Um, it's really cool to be able to work with her because it's fun to be able to bounce off ideas and it's also taking away another point from having to describe topics a little differently because some kids don't get that very first one. Um, so co-teaching, we've had some different styles, different techniques. Um, I'll let Noah talk about his experience too, because he's fortunate to experience that as well. Yeah, so same, he got to uh, co-teach with Chloe Fluhop last year, and I get the privilege of uh, getting to co-teach with her this year. Um, so it, like he said, it's been really cool to be able to bounce those ideas off each other, um, especially with her background of being able to work with um, students with more needs 
um, how to break things down and use hands-on um, things to be able to, to explain the math. So I'm um, being able to, to be there to teach the way that I teach and then also have her ideas bounce off. Now we're able to reach more students um, and hopefully um, instruct better for them. So I'm also excited this Friday we get to go to a, um, a professional development where there is, um, it's all about co-teaching. So we're going to be learning different strategies and being able to plan alongside some of the teachers that we get to uh, work with next year as well. And then um, the next thing we're going to talk about is building thinking classrooms. Uh, I know last year at the board meeting that the math team uh, was presenting at, we brought to the idea that over the summer, two years ago now I guess, uh, we all started reading the book uh, Building Thinking Classrooms uh, and we started to implement it more and more. Uh, it's a book by Peter Ledgerall, I can't really pronounce his last name, it's a Swedish name, his name's Peter. Um, <laughs> but uh, so what the intention was, we see a lot of math where people don't like math because it's very cut and dry, that's why I liked it growing up. Um, but we wanted kids to get more out of it because we keep getting kids asking, when am I going to need this in real life? When am I going to need you know, how to graph a line, all these stuff. And the big thing was developing critical thinking skills. And what this book is talking about is find different ways to have kids think. Uh, so these are some pictures where one of the big thing is having a vertical whiteboard, having kids on their feet rather than sitting at a desk, kind of doing rote memorization. Um, math facts are so important. But uh, having kids think rather than just mimicking. Um, and so kids have really bought in on this and uh, we give them tasks where they're thinking where they're not given the answers. Some of them are related to the curriculum we're doing currently. Some of them are just non-curriculum days where we give them problem solving tasks and they're at it. And so the picture you see with all the kids there, um, that was the day I was actually gone. And you could just see all the kids' excitement huddled around the board. Uh, that was the day we actually were at a math conference with Peter presenting. Um, so kids are buying into it at the beginning of the year, especially the sixth graders, they hated it when I said I'm not answering that question. Um, they asked stop thinking questions like, hey, am I right? I don't know, prove to me. Um, but they've gotten the habit of it and they get disappointed when I say, hey, we're not going to whiteboards today. So it's fun to see it and I know Noah uses it as well. Yeah, it's something that we're moving towards because we really want to build the skills of of being able to problem solve and critically think rather than just reciprocate the things that we tell them to do, you know? So having those skills outside of school is super important because we don't want them to just take someone's word for it, Google something and just go with that answer, but being able to back up their answer and have reasoning and being able to look at it and decipher whether it's it's true or not or whether it makes sense or not. Um, so it's something that, that we're moving towards and, and I'm really excited about it too. And, and it really encourages collaboration as well. So we think that that's something important that, that they're bouncing ideas off each other just like we are when we're co-teaching. Like we're able to, to become better and create more, you know, put more, our minds together to, to be more successful. Because even the mathematicians who created all the math that we're doing, they didn't do it themselves. They did it with other people. So them being able to have the option to do it um, is really important. Um, the next thing that we're going to be talking about is the curriculum that we're moving towards. So before, it, we had some big ideas, um, math that we were doing out of a textbook, um, but we also kind of built pieces of our curriculum and, and pulled pieces together that we thought were rich. Um, but there is a new uh, resource out there, it's called Illustrative Mathematics, and it's a free curriculum, um, but it is, it's really good, it's highly rated, um, and our math consultant from Grant Wood is, is pushing towards it, a lot of schools are moving towards it, but it ties in with our building thinking classrooms perfectly. It just meshes perfectly. Um, where it gets kids up at the boards, um, everything is real world related. So rather than being like, rather than us teaching just the Pythagorean theorem, now it's like, okay, it's a whole problem and they have to figure out where it comes from. Like why is the Pythagorean theorem even a thing? Where did it come from? How can you get to the conclusion? And then we start introducing some of these formulas and some of these things that are gonna assist them and it makes it so much easier. Um, so they're just able to tie things in uh, to real life things, like if we're looking at the pitch of a roof, like being able to calculate those measurements um, with the, the things that they're doing. Because like, like Ryan said earlier, 
they say, when are we ever going to use this? So if we can teach them these skills and, and teach it to them in a realistic way, then they're able to, to stick with those things. They're able to understand it more and be more interested in it. Um, and it has a lot of different things. There's, there's farming, there is agriculture, which is part of that, I guess. <laughs> uh, there is things with like doctors, lawyers, all different types of professions that they might get into eventually. Um, it has all those um, topics built in with the curriculum. So uh, we're pretty excited about it. We are piloting one of the units this year already. Um, the kids are buying in and we're seeing a lot of growth from it too. Um, so I'm really excited about it and, and I think that it'll be good for us next year. Thank you for letting us speak and uh, thank you for coming out tonight. As you can see um, by what they talk, both groups talked about tonight, collaboration is really an important piece for us. We don't want um, teachers working in isolation or in silos. We want them working together for the benefit of our kids. And you're seeing five examples of it right here. And again, this Friday, we're gonna have that opportunity to get some training, some more training with our entire staff. So that becomes a lot more of the norm around Albert Inn. So um, Switching gears a little bit, we're going to, I'm going to talk about, and hopefully these guys chime in, about something new that we're doing uh, at Albernet this spring semester, and it is called the Attributes for Success. Some of you may have gotten a sheet that has been sent home, and others will this, this in the next week here, um, regarding different attributes that we, as a school, think are important for our students to have, and, and we, I'll talk about where we got those. So, the origination of this is from the work that I know SIAC did and uh, different groups did around our profile of a graduate. So if you look at the different different areas that we feel like when a student leaves Albernet, they need to, to have these skills. Be community-minded citizens, emotionally intelligent people, people who lead, effective communicators, and lifelong learners. So that's kind of hard to, to be actionable with. So what we did is we took a look at um, the, the things that we hear from parents, the things that we hear from community members, from the world of work, and what we see in the classrooms and the athletic fields in different areas. And we, we took some time during professional development and just threw, I don't know, 50, 60 phrases on the board of what are, what are things we want our kids to be able to know and do. And what we came up with are these five areas that I think hopefully we can agree are really important for student success and then also lifelong success after after school. So perseverance and then responsibility, respect, trustworthiness, and curiosity. So in, uh, how we, can you all see those? So, Mr. Carver, can you see that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is that an age thing? <laughs> <laughs> Never. So what we do with what we do with this information. So our process, uh, basically, we, first of all, I have to give kudos to Ryan Gable, and I told him that I was gonna embarrass him up here, but this was an idea that we had, a, a very simple idea um, to, to try to, honestly, these guys and the rest of the teachers, the, the core teachers, they rate, not rate, that's the wrong word, they score every student every two weeks on, on these different um, attributes. And so they were putting a lot of time and effort into it, so we wanted a system that was pretty efficient. Mr. Gable over there, and I'll put a plug in for a side business for him. If you have any uh, Google Sheets or Excel needs, <laughs> he's your man for sure. So he spent a lot of time creating this system for us, and um, it really is uh, an efficient way for us to um, score students, give them feedback, give parents feedback on how their students are doing, and not just in an academic way. These. These are going to be academic and non-academic behaviors that we know are impacting their success at school, whether that's socially or academically. So what we do, um, and I guess I should back up a little bit. The, the one big deal thing that we, we did when I go into this here in a second is we took a lot of time to get consensus on what these things meant. So backing up, we, we got consensus on what we wanted, the five words, and then consensus on the phrases. What was important about those phrases? So curiosity. I can approach problems with curiosity and critical thinking. I can take risks and I'm willing to try something new. I'm gonna tell you honestly, most of our kids 
rate low in this. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's probably, if we rated ourselves, we rate ourselves low on that. But we wanted to get a, a real sense of what, what that looked like for an individual student. And then the second part that we did, and you can see this on your, if you have the paper in front of you, there's a scale at the bottom that says consistently performs this way, occasionally needs support, needs a lot of support essentially, and then does not show any evidence of that. We wanted to get, we had lots of conversations, I wouldn't say arguments, but there was definitely some, some back and forth on what, what a four looked like, what a three looked like, two, one, because we need that data to look the same across the classrooms. We need, we need Kristen's version of a four to match Becca's, to match Casey's, and, and down the line, so that the data is realistic and, and provides us really good insight. So again, that's, that's kind of how we did that. So the process, the teachers individually rate their students on a four to zero scale, as you can see. Um, you can see that scale on the handout. They then get together. Um, we carve out time during the day. So if your students talk about gym time, I have some kids in the gym or they're in advisory, and then these guys have a chance to meet, and they talk about this, the, how the students are performing in their room. So they, that is a really important piece, I think. And I think the important way we do it is they're grading them, scoring them, and then they're getting together. So there's not a group think type of situation where it's like, oh, Josh is an idiot in my room, and oh, he's you know like that in my room too. Let's all score him too. You know, it's more of I have him with this, I have him with this. What are you seeing? What are we seeing? Because that's the important conversation. The important conversation is Noah saying he's he's great in my room. I mean, things are going well. I'm giving him fours across the board. And what are you doing that we're not doing? What's he doing in your room that we're not doing? That's the important conversation because that's the conversation we want to have with the student right later. So, um, so it's important that they're collect again that word collaboration. They're collaborating together to to look at that student score. So then, um, the teachers do that. They have a discussion. Then um, the next couple steps are kind of similar at the same time. The teachers send home the attribute sheet every two weeks for all students. So again, some of you have had those, some of you haven't gotten those yet, and you will, that, that have middle school students. Um, we meet with students under a 3.0 in any category to develop a plan and goals to increase their skills in a particular area. Students fill out a reflection sheet about their scores, and the student meets with the teachers, again, in a couple weeks, to update how they're doing on that. So, so again, it's like, it's like grades, right? You know, we want to make sure that they're doing this and, and understanding and learning the material, but we also want to make sure that they are improving in all these, these skill areas as well. So um, if a student isn't making progress after those couple weeks, that is probably where I'm gonna step in. And we're probably gonna have a, a parent meeting and say, hey, these, you know, whether it's one area of responsibility or you know, one big one we probably have, especially right now, I'll be honest with our eighth grade group of students is respectful behavior towards each other, towards just, just in general. So um, that's something that, that we, want to work on. Um, so, you know, that's something that if a student is still not doing that, that's probably where I'll be involved and where um, we'll get parents involved in that and have a meeting to, to do that as well. So, um, if it's, so the other question that I even got from these guys is, why send this out to everyone? Why, why every student? Why not just the students that are struggling? And I understand that because it's a lot of work to send this to every kid. And a couple of reasons. Um, if you look on, I think it's sample number two, for the most part, that student um, is doing great, right? They're, they're doing really good. They have straight A's, but if you look at the one category where they're struggling is respectful behavior. So we don't send that out every, you know, um, every couple weeks. You're, you're not gonna necessarily see those things as a parent. Because now, I think they're above a three still, so we wouldn't necessarily send that out, but but now as a parent, I see that and I can still have that conversation. Hey, you're doing a really good job, but your teachers are saying that you're, you're not really that respectful in the classroom to your peers. So what are we doing to work on that? So they're not really to that level where we're gonna intervene with them yet, but it's still important to have that transparent communication with, with parents. You know? The other thing is we might see big changes or you might see big changes in their score. So what if they've been at all fours and then all of a sudden this week they're at twos? Well, obviously something's going on at home or at school that we need to talk about with them or you need to talk about with them. So I think this is a great way that, that we can communicate those things with parents, with each other to see like, holy cow, Josh has really dropped off this week. Does anybody know what's going on? You know, his dog died this week, so you know, he's, he's been really upset.
percent or whatever it is. So that's an important piece too. I also think too. Go ahead. Adding on that aspect, maybe as a parent, I know skill wise co-workers and my student, like my own children where they need to be. If they're struggling with something with math and reading or science, I know that we have the staff that's able to do that, and then we get other skills as far as the ones that um, we've highlighted here. Those are like the foundational skills to be a successful person in the future, making sure that you can get along with co-workers, making sure you understand the expectations of the environment that you're in. And as a parent, I think it's important that I know where my students are at. So it's continuing the conversation of so every other week just getting that information and being able to use that conversation at home as well. Absolutely. I hear that a lot from parents. Um, I don't really care what their grades are. They do, but I care what, they're, what they act like at school. This is an opportunity to kind of to give that information out in, in a more regular, consistent way and, and have those conversations with students and improve those areas because again, if you use that, that one student as an example, straight A student, right? So if we don't communicate anything else and they're not you know, below that line, you know, you may not know that they're kind of a, a stinker in class to, to their peers. And, and that might be something that you want to address or you, you know, want our help addressing. So, so how we, oh, here's the samples here. I'll show you these. I don't know that I can. You have them in front of you, but. Again, so they're rated in every core class plus PE because we, we just wanted to get a good um, look at data. And you'll see the, uh, I don't have a, this is the only year in my career that I have confiscated a laser pointer from somebody else, so I don't have a laser pointer. If you look at this, we have their week and their year to date. And so what we want to do is look at their year to date might be low, but then this week might start to be higher. So are they, are they improving throughout the, the year? So again, sample one is a student who's struggling across all areas. So we would bring that student in and they meet as a team. And it probably is a little intimidating for that student, but we feel it's important if they're struggling across the board that they, that they hear that and they, they're making a plan. And that's the important part too, is they're making a plan. We're making a plan with them. Uh, we're making a plan to support them. And, and let's say it's responsibility. They're really struggling to turn their school in. Or they're not, they're not doing very well in their school because they're not using their time wisely. You know, that's something we're going to make a plan with specifically for that. Or they're not being respectful. Or they're, they're going into class and they just, they just won't try. You know, Casey talked about the mock trial. And they just can't get up there and, and you know, talk in front of kids. Or they can't do those things. So we really want to pinpoint what the issue is with the student and then help support them through that. And, and that's a lot of different things. Because we feel like if we can get these behaviors into that 3.25 to 4 range, then what we're going to see is their academics will be fine. Their behavior will be fine. Their social connections will be fine. And, and that's what ultimately what we want is them to be able to be fine, be good, you know, to do, do all those things well. So. How we use the data? Um, we want to help individual students. Like I said, we're going to talk to, uh, I don't know, Kristen, you said you had eight to 10 students that you had to meet with individually that were under a 3.0. So in, in that sense, they're going to bring those students in. They're going to meet with them. They're going to develop a plan. The student has a, a sheet that they fill out, and, and we will revisit that plan in a few weeks. Um, groups of students. So let's say I talked about the eighth grade group. We know that maybe respectful behavior towards each other is an issue. Um, so what are we going to do about that? We're going to make a plan as a staff to address that, whether that's some lessons in their guidance class, whether that's they need um, me to come in and have a conversation with them, whether we're, um, we develop phrases that we're going to use with students at all times when we're seeing that disrespectful behavior, whether that's all, you know, those type of things. Then the other part that I, that I think is, is interesting about this is we can use it with teachers as well. So let's say that... Um, and Ms. Copas, her ratings are consistently low in responsibility. Her, her students are at twos and ones, and in that same group, Mr. Gables are at threes and fours. And so we, as a, myself and Ms. Copas, would have a conversation about why, what's going on with, with your classroom, what's, what's going on in your environment that students don't feel that they need to do their schoolwork, whereas in other environments they're doing their schoolwork. So it allows us to have conversations and, and 
reflect on, on how we're doing as teachers as well, because it, it really is data points for, for us as well. So, And then I, again, I would use it for that information. How can I help support a teacher that might be struggling with a group of students? How can I help support a teacher that might be struggling uh, with respectful behavior in their class? Or, you know, they're not getting the students to be very um, critical thinkers or curious. We would use that information to help support them in that way as well. Then also those students that are continuing kind of to be in that one and two range, they're, they're the, the high flyers, I guess, a little bit into the, the office. And they're really not improving in these scores. That's where I would also get involved to, to help support that student. Okay, so how are we gonna measure success? Um, we just started this in the last couple weeks, so we don't, this is hopefully how we're going to measure success. Our, our grade data, we want to decrease the number of low and failing grades. We don't have a ton of them, but we want zero of them. I mean, that's the goal right now is to have nobody that has low and failing grades. That ultimately, like I said, the goal is to have everybody in, in that range where they're, they're doing great work. Uh, behavior referrals, again, it, this is, I, I don't want to make this seem like we have this big issue in Alberta with behavior referrals. We obviously have 12 to 14 year olds, so we certainly see some behaviors, but we want to have fewer of them. We want to have zero, that's the goal, right? So we want to have fewer office referrals. Uh, parent collaboration, do we have more parent communication involvement? I sent a DNF um, list out last Friday, and I've had more parent communication in the last four days than I had all year long combined. And so that's good, right? I mean, essentially, that's like, duh, Josh, why weren't you doing that throughout the whole year? Because I think sometimes as parents, myself included, we get busy moving, you know, and we just trust that our kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then we look, come to conferences and it's like, whoa, hold on a second. And so we want to just ramp up that communication. We want to, and same with the behaviors. We want to have you all as parents to have that transparent communication on how your student's doing. So you can ask those questions. You can meet with teachers. You can talk with your students. So. And then the other thing that I was thinking, this is not really measurable, but it's something that I think is really important. It's the feel of a building, right? When you walk in, and I'll tell you right now, we have a great staff, we have a great culture at Alvernet, but there's things we can improve on. And you get that feel of a building that just, um, it, it's, uh, are there respectful conversations happening in the hallways? Are kids running through the hallways like crazy? Are they doing things right now? And right now the sixth graders, to sit outside Ms. Gobus' room because they were not, um, the feel of the building was not where I thought it needed to be. So we are we are trying to do these things so that we can increase that, just that uh, when you walk in, you just know that, man, this is a really great place to be. And, and it is, but again, it's not perfect and that's what we're striving for. <coughs> and then the goal, obviously with this, is that every student walks out of here as an eighth grader, ready to consistently demonstrate the skills that are necessary for success in high school and beyond. That is the ultimate goal is we want our kids to go to high school and thrive and be successful and then move past that into the world of work or college or whatever their, their plan is and, and be successful in adulthood as well. So next steps, um, we're going to continue to evaluate our attributes and our data to make sure we're measuring the right things. You know, we might have a group of students next year where we decide that one of these attributes isn't isn't what we want to measure, we want to look at something else. So it's not going to be this thing that stays the same. We, we need, I think, as a staff, the, this group of people, I will tell you, I've come to them several times this year and been like, hey, what do you think about this? Or, hey, let's change this. This isn't working. And they, probably behind my back, say some things that I deserve, but they, uh, <laughs> they definitely just jump on that and, and are willing to make changes. So that's what's awesome about them is we'll evaluate this at all times and, and make sure that we're doing the, the right thing for the group of kids that we have. Um, we'll look at our data and make sure our scale is accurate and develop a rubric for each attribute. That's one thing we haven't done. So what does a four look like? What does that actually say in there? That a student who is at a four does these things. And, and that's what we want to do in a three. So it's a little more um, data driven that way. And then um, is, our, is our scale accurate? We've already had some conversations that we feel like our scale maybe jumps too much. If you look at it, it says consistently and then occasionally. And we've talked about like that's a pretty big jump from does it all the time to occasionally to me is like 
less than 50%. And so do we need a do we need a level in between there? Right now that would skew our data pretty badly, so we don't want to do that. But as we're moving forward into next year, that is probably something that we've already talked about making a change for. Another thing is getting students more involved in the process. We, and I know you guys did this last year with having them break themselves a little bit. We'd like them to score themselves as well. And, and kind of then what we probably do is meet with students where there's a large discrepancy. If we're seeing them at fours and they're seeing themselves at a two, we'll meet and say what's going on or vice versa. Um, and then I think this is an important one. We want to evaluate where we give these students authentic opportunities to practice these skills and then add them into our curriculum. So if we say trustworthiness is an important skill that we need to, to look at, where are we making sure that's in our, our their daily life? Where, where are we making sure that we're giving them opportunities to practice responsibility, maybe other than just turning in their schoolwork on time? Because there's other ways to show that. There's other ways to, to do those things. So we need to evaluate that we're giving kids authentic opportunities to do that. And not just a, a curriculum or we're not going to do like a hex class where we say, okay, this week it's responsibility and this week it's, that doesn't work. And then um, lastly, uh, an exciting piece that you guys will get that, I mean, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't like JMC, but if you don't like JMC, um, we're getting a new student information system, Alma, and I think it's going to be really um, good to be efficient. Ryan's not really happy with me because he, he's going to lose out on all the business that I give him uh, making all these spreadsheets, but um, the... We're going to be able to be more efficient, and that's going to communicate with you guys better on grades, on these things, on attendance. So we're excited about how that can fit into this process as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Tammy Drapa, and I am here uh, on behalf of the Iowa Association of School Boards. I spent 15 years on my local board and get to work with districts all across the state. And when Will reached out and said, would I help uh, do a little facilitation tonight, I was super excited and I was a little scared. And then I had a call with Josh and Will and I got even more excited because I got a preview to some of this uh, stuff. So it was really exciting. I'm going to put you all to work though, because just like we have to get up and write on the math boards and kids need to move around, right? Adults need to do that too, and I want you to have a chance to just chat a little bit. In your um, clipboard though, I think you have a document that yours one doesn't have all the scribbling on it that mine does. I was trying to take some copious notes, but there's one that has the Iowa Association School Board's logo on the top left-hand corner, and it says Roles of the Board for Improving Student Learning. And I know you aren't all on the board, but I want to share this work with you because uh, it's, it's important into what your staff just presented to you. So the research behind Lighthouse, and Will said tonight's a Lighthouse session. The research um, started in Iowa. It reached uh, into other states. But in the world of education, if you, if you talk about the Lighthouse research, people know that it came from Iowa, and it was credited uh, to Iowa, and people perk up if you say, oh, you're from Iowa, and you know the research. And the research in its simplest of forms, not to uh, give any, uh, I'm not giving enough attention to the research, but in simplest forms, the research said, if we go into districts where we see students, where there's high achievement happening in the district, and then we shift, and we look to our Board of Education, what are key things that we see happening? And they're the five key things that you see on, your, uh, on the sheet. So it says that you have a board that sets clear and high expectations. That can look like a variety of things, but my favorite one is when you hear your board say, we believe all students can learn, period. Not just some of them, not just the ones that are already excelling. We believe all students can learn. And I wrote as fast as I could, friends, when you were all talking, so I hope I credit to the right person. But Kristen, I think you were the one who said, my students were shocked when they were going to have to write seven paragraphs. And your very next sentence was, I wasn't. I knew they could do it. <laughs> I got goosebumps when I heard that. 
And your board knows that every single one of your students um, can achieve. So that set clear high expectations is sometimes just as simple as how they talk around the table and how they set goals. The create conditions for success is part of that is I heard there was some professional development and I heard staff really liked it. And so being able to say we're going to support staff in the best way we can with professional development. Do you all have early outs? I see some heads nodding. Yes, so it's a beautiful way to say it's that important that we want to give our staff time that they get to either learn from each other, learn from someone that they're bringing in, etc. Um, and a big piece of that is stay the course. And so while you while your while your staff is introducing new curriculum, we know that there's going to be challenges with that. Um, but we're going to stay the course. We're going to hang tight. We're going to wait and see. So what what happens next? What will that look like? Um, holding the system accountable uh, is when your board says, what does the data say? What does the data tell us? Versus, I heard at the grocery store, someone said, because we hear that, but that the board says, what does the data tell us? And what does the data look like? And you're going to have a great new data set that the board will get to uh, look at and talk about. And then building collective will. So very similar to what they're doing tonight is a great example to talk about how do we get some of these things we're doing out, sharing them with our community. My hope for you all is, I think you have a couple more of these sessions before the end of the year. My hope is that we get a little bit more of the auditorium filled and by May that we're maybe overflowing a little bit. You have so many people that want to come in here. Um, and that, that's, it's, that can be hard to do. So getting that word out and building the energy and the excitement. And then tonight, your board's learning together because they're here. They've invited you to join them and learn about what's happening. And then they get to sit at the table and have really great conversation. And sometimes they may have to have hard conversation. There were lots of times when I sat as a board member, I had to say to the staff, I don't know what that means. Remind me what is ELA again. And that wasn't all oh, that was not those weren't easy questions to ask, but it was how we learned together. So that's just a little tee up of the lighthouse research. And if you're really excited and you go home, you can, as I say, go to the Googler and you can Google that. And then I think you could use the race um, acronym and pull together what you find out. So here's what I would like you to do. Turn that paper over and there's two questions. And I would like you to, um, I'm going to give you just a couple minutes because I know uh, I think you all were promised an 8 o'clock leave time. I'm kidding, it's 7 o'clock. All right, I just want to see if I can get a reaction. No one reacted. It was you all were very polite. Uh, so there's two questions that say key insights. And the first one is um, just give a, give a little self-reflection. Think about what you heard and jot down what's a question or thought that you had about what you heard tonight. You heard a ton of stuff as you can see by all of my scribbles that I made. Uh, but just jot something down. And I am going to ask you, you've kind of got some clusters of folks, so I'm going to ask you to share with each other. So if talking to people you don't know gives you hives and makes you nervous, you will be forewarned you're about to do it. Uh, and then the second question is, I want you to think about what's something that you heard tonight that you wish every person in Albernet knew? I hate to interrupt your conversations, but I want to be mindful of your time, and I want you to share. Um, I want you to share out because I just heard so many beautiful things. Um, who wants to share something you heard in your group about on question number one about just a, a key takeaway that you have, something that was kind of a ha for you? I wanted to ask this question anyway, so that's why I'm sharing. Um, so ultimately. I think the, the plan itself sounds phenomenal and it sounds awesome. The one area that I'm concerned about, or maybe want to know if you guys have thought about, is in, um, in my world, I had a great leader who had a theory called the airplane theory, where an airplane can only take off, you know, 35,000 pounds can only fit on it or whatever. If you, want to, if you want to take off 
and you're over 35,000 pounds, you gotta take off some weight. So my my worry is, is there anything in, in your guys' next steps to evaluate for the teachers for later on where we're saying, you're gonna be grading every student every two weeks, and you know, uh oh, Jimmy's at 2.95, and what I wouldn't want to happen is someone to go, well, they're at a three or four, so no plan for them. I, I don't want to continually put too much on the teachers then to where they make this great tool just becomes an end, you know, or, or whatever down, down the lane. To where maybe it is a really good tool to use, but in a year we have to evaluate and go, maybe we should take something off or move something else that wasn't working as well. They have quite a few minutes each week to collaborate with each other about each, each of those students that are kind of in that boat. So I think that um, that allows us to have honest communication about those students. And then they, you can't really have an honest conversation about a student and then go and put a, a four. You know what I mean? So I, I, that's a great point. And, but we definitely have addressed that it's really important to um, make sure that the data is accurate and that you're not skewing it because you don't want to necessarily have to send something home or, or have that conversation. Is that kind of answer what you're talking about, Dan? Yep, it is. And I just want to make sure then that maybe after a while of using it, as teachers, they feel comfortable with saying, it's working great, but I am spending a lot of time, you know, doing this or that. Yeah, something that's been great too is we are very, we, we can spend hours talking about the kids and um, we try to, we try to go through it as efficiently as possible, but Josh is flexible and he gave us an extra hour this week where he, he took the kids during advisory time to the gym and we got to finish up. So it's not something we want to settle with and he's really helped out buying us that extra time to do it the right way. So it's been good. And I know when I kind of made the sheet too, like the year to date stuff, we really don't see that very, it's pretty low on the screen. So you don't really see what the year-to-date data is, and I think us staff would do a pretty good job of, if we have to meet with a kid, we really want to meet with the kid to make sure that he's, that person is getting to where they want to be at, where we expect them to be at. Um, and the big thing is, Casey and I were just talking, like we want to see the growth too. And so um, I think we do as much as we can with the honest feedback. And if that means we have to spend a five, 10 minute meeting with the kid, that can change the whole world and the whole, site for that kid because I do understand a little pep talk every now and then. And they already gave me excellent feedback right away because we our plan was to do this weekly. And they're like, eh, that's that's not that's not realistic at all. And so we've gone to two weeks and we've even talked about maybe um, finding that sweet spot of what's an appropriate amount of time to um, to make sure that we're having accurate data but maybe like three weeks is too long because the kid might be okay and then that last week they're not and then now their data is skewed because of that. So um, we definitely have ongoing conversations about what this looks like. And again, I, I think I talked about that at the end about evaluating this practice and making sure that, it, that we're always looking at it and making sure it's the best way to do it. Another thing that I'm doing this summer is there's another school district, I can't remember where right off the top of my head, that is, is doing something very similar to this. Um, and they're going to be presenting at a conference this summer, so I'm going to definitely attend that and try to get with that person and um, see what they're doing and see how we can share resources and, and to be more efficient. Because, like you said, it is a lot of work for the teachers, but I think it's the right work, and I think they do too. The, we wouldn't have done any of this without their buy-in, and they, I, again, maybe again behind my back they're not, but to my face they're all in, which is awesome. So. How about a, um, what do you wish everybody in Albernet knew about what you heard tonight? Who wants to tackle that one? I'm coming back. Hold on. Um, just the thought I had as, you can't do that too, you don't have to. Okay, I'll say that. Um, I just don't think people realize, it's not necessarily like something I specifically or we talked about, but I don't think people realize that this place is, isn't somewhere where like our kids just go and spend, you know, nine months. Like there's people behind the scenes, like you guys are employees, you're doing a job, you are um, always putting your best efforts to make yourselves better so our kids can get better. And I think people forget that. And I just wanted to comment on that. Like 
as a mom of four kids and two of them are in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say that like things are always growing and changing with school and I don't think people realize that. Like, so I just wanted to kudos to them. I love that. You get better so our kids can get better, which tells your board there's a great investment in professional development. Um, so I'm a sixth grade. This is, this is really loud. Uh, sorry. Uh, and uh, I know Mr. Gable said this in his presentation, but his classroom makes me more excited for math than the actual subject does. Because, like, it's, like, a lot more interactive than something, like, just sitting down at a desk with a pencil and writing down on some random piece of paper. And, and mostly in Gables, uh, we get to go to the whiteboards and it's, and we get to, like, draw down stuff and I'm, and, like, get to, like, interact with other kids more than something most other cl classrooms would do. And I just think math makes like like I just like math more because I used not used to not like math, but now I do even more. So thank you, Gable. I guess. Not not so many other board members on the spot. What do you wish everybody at Albert Ant knew based on what you heard tonight? Dr. Rock, paper, scissors, just getting answer. <laughs> well, we kind of also talked about that. Uh, the point that Josh made, which I thought was great, that he kind of said, we don't have a real problem with this in Alberman, but we want to make it perfect, or as close to perfect as possible. And I think people should just know how much, you know, the staff and the administrators uh, care for the kids. You know, as parents of these kids, we would want nothing less. So thank you. I want to honor your time. Uh, I would stand and ask for your feedback all night, but um, I'm happy while I have, uh, if anybody needs to leave, this is not my show, Will, I just told them where they could leave if they wanted to. Uh, but I'm also happy to run the mic if you have any other specific questions for your staff. I just have a quick question and I'll keep it short. But on the attributes um, for the students in middle school, I was wondering, those kiddos that are scoring three or higher, um, are there any discussions in classes they're not getting like that one on one time about how they can improve their scores? Um, like for example, like curiosity, that was something you said that a lot of the kids are scoring low in and just are they given tangible ways that they can actually do that? And you know, whether or not they uh, take that advice is one thing, but just curious about that discussion in the classroom. If you, if, you know how much they know about this as well. Okay, I'll take that one. So that's one of the things that we talked about when we met in our um, professional learning group in the sixth grade this week. So we met on Tuesday, and that was the discussion that came up. How can we put these numbers in front of the students, and how can you know the, the form goes home to the parents, and then how also can the students see their scores? And I kind of. When I was talking to my team, I equated it to, you know, knowing your stats from a game to a game or, you know, I used to coach cross country, so like your times from meets to meets, like having those numbers in front of you. So what we're adding in starting next week is going to be a paper form that the students fill out. Here are my weekly totals for each of those five categories. Here's how those weekly totals compare against my year to date. And then they have some reflective questions to answer. What's going well? What can I improve upon? What's a goal that I have for next time? And then we'll have that paper form go home to get signed by parents too. So parents are going to also be getting from us as teachers the whole spreadsheet to see the comments and the scoring kind of across the board. And then they're also going to get that added that student reflection piece. So you are going to get the students that are above the benchmark and above that area, and which will open the conversations of okay, yeah, I'm not, at a, you know, I'm not at a four and I want to be, or my score was a little lower this week in curiosity, what can maybe some things that I do, and then that, that's our avenue to get there, to do those things. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I hope you will all uh, find someone in the next week to share 
your thoughts about what do you wish everyone in Albernet knew. Uh, friends, I'd move at a heartbeat. I have no children to offer you. It would not be helpful to the district, but um, I'm really excited about some of the things that I hear, and I'm going to be watching to see what happens next. So.